you know, I, I love it. It's a beautiful song, and um, I think it's a beautiful sentiment because when you think about our lives, the vast majority of our days uh, are in the waiting, aren't they? We don't get to live on the mountaintop. And, you know, I think it's a good reminder for us when we read the scriptures, you know, when you read the Old Testament, you see these massive breakthrough moments. But what we fail to recognize is that sometimes, because we're just reading the highlights, there's hundreds of years even in between these massive moments where God breaks through. Same thing in the New Testament. We see all these incredible highlights. What we don't read about are all the simple days. The disciples are just walking around in the waiting like Jesus what are you really doing here, buddy? You know, sometimes it feels like that in our lives. And yet we cling to this promise that he meets us in the waiting and sees us through to ultimate victory. Amen. This morning, we're going to continue our series. We, um, we paused it last week. We had a guest speaker that stayed over from the conference. But this morning, we're going to pick up and start back in First Thessalonians. Today, we're in chapter three. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, one quick note about Holy Week before I jump in there. I'm really excited. You heard about a number of those opportunities that we have to come together during this sacred time of year coming up. A couple of notes. One, we have Thursday night service, 7 o'clock. Friday night service, 7 o'clock. Saturday, that prayer experience. You can come anytime during that to experience that prayer walk, okay? But we won't have our normal Saturday 5.30 service. That prayer experience will replace our normal Saturday service. Then on Sunday morning, we have an extra service. We're going to have a a 7 a.m. sunrise service out in the parking lot. Uh, It'll be a shorter service, but if you're interested in that, please come. Beautiful sunrise service at 7, and then we'll have a normal worship celebrations at 9.30 and 11. All right? So you got plenty of opportunity to come and worship uh, this Holy Week. It's going to be fun. All right, I want to, I want to jump into, uh, I'm going to actually start at the end of chapter 2 in 1 Thessalonians because it kind of, this is where the section actually starts, and then continue and read uh, chapter 3. It's not very long, and I just kind of want you to get the gist of all that Paul is saying here. I want you to pay attention to what are the kind of themes that you hear coming through. I uh, remember, uh, just to give you a little context again, Paul is writing this letter to a group of Christians in Thessalonica, a city that's in current day Greece. And he had spent some time with them, shared the gospel with them. People came to Christ. Because of some persecution that broke out, he had to leave quicker than he intended. And you're actually going to hear in this chapter why I've been saying that. You'll, you'll hear some of the framing so that you hear how he then sends Timothy back to check on these Christians to make sure that they're standing firm in the faith. And then he writes this letter after Timothy comes back and gives him a good report. Okay, you'll hear that in these verses today. So look with me. We'll start at verse 17 of chapter 2. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. So he's saying, I want, we wanted to get back to you. You're going to hear that longing come through in this text over and over. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Okay, you can hear like how uh, intense uh, Paul longs for these people, how he loves these people. Listen to that, how that continues. So when we could stand it no longer... We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, and we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in the, in the God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen, why did he send Timothy? To strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. Remember, these are people who are still going through persecution, still experiencing hardship because of their faith in Jesus. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. He's speaking here of that hardship, of the trials. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. We warned you of this, he's saying. And it turned turned out that way, as you well know. You know it because you're experiencing it. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid in some way that the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. You know, that you may have fallen away, he's saying, from Jesus. But look at verse 6. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. 
He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. Now listen to this. This is how strongly he, he's invested in their spiritual life. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. It's like, no, we can take a deep breath. We can really live because we've heard the good news that you're still walking with Jesus. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. And then listen at the end, verse 11. This gives you kind of a, there's a closing sort of benediction to this section, his, his longing, the, his sort of his prayers for the people. Now may our Lord and, uh, and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. And may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. That last line, remember, is, it points again to what I talked about, the, the theme of this letter, the people of the day. Looking towards the end when Jesus will come again, stand firm, remain blameless in his sight until that day. Okay, now I, I read a big section of that text for you, but... Um, Here's, here's one thing that's really clear to me. If I just had to say one kind of theme from this chapter, one thing that just jumps right off the page to me is that Paul has a deep, deep love for these Thessalonian Christians. Could you hear that coming through in the text? Like, I long to be with you. you keep saying this over and over again. I, I, I want to be with you, but you, you've given us life. You're, it's our glory and joy that you're standing firm in Jesus. Like, he's deeply invested in these people. And this actually, as I was reading this this week, um, this, this, this chapter challenged me in that respect. Can you imagine in your own life being that excited, that invested spiritually in the well-being of others even more than yourself? You know, our tendency as human beings, I think this is for all of us, our tendency is to be really into ourselves. You know, even in, in spiritual things, we want to be, you know, we're all concerned with our growth, you know, what God is doing in our life. And but what we see here in Paul is that like his whole life is wrapped up in what God is doing in other people. The joy that he discovers in his own life is joy that comes from what he's seeing Christ do in someone else, not just in himself. And when you read Paul's letters, you see this kind of heart come through in all of his letters, actually. The way that he prays for the people, prays for the churches, prays for the Christians that he's encountered. The way that he longs for them, the way that he urges them on. He's deeply invested in their spiritual life. He, he seems to love them and long for their closeness to Jesus even more than he does for his own self. Remember, this, this is the same Paul who... In this letter, he, he didn't even get to spend that long with these people. I mean, it, it got pretty abbreviated because of the circumstances. And that even with that short time, there's some kind of a spiritual bond that has taken place in Christ. I think what you see is, even though they were together just a short time, they've become family. And Paul is all in on them having victory in Christ. I think that's what, what real love does, right? Real love always leads to longing for the best in someone else's life. So much of our, our life, like I said a moment ago, is, is spent worrying about ourselves. Often when we think of others, we think of others in a kind of comparative sense, kind of where do we rank each other? But here, you don't see that at all in Paul. You see him celebrating the success of these people standing firm in their faith. I think this is an important key uh, for Christians in general, actually. Um, in the body of Christ, you know, uh, Paul in the New Testament often compares the church to a body of, as a metaphor. And in the body of Christ, here's a, an important principle. 
Victory in one limb of the body is always victory for the whole body. Does that make sense? Victory in one limb of the body is always victory for the whole body. I mean, you can think about this in very practical terms about, about your own human body. Um, it's, it's in your hand's best interest that your eyes are working well, right? When you're hammering a nail or you're cooking something on a hot stove, it's helpful to your hand if your eyes are seeing well, right? <laughs> Amen? You're not in competition with one another. You long for the success of both parts of the body or all parts of the body. You need each part to work well. And conversely, um, when, when one part suffers, your whole body suffers, doesn't it? I remember uh, one time when I was a youth pastor, this is many years ago, and I was uh, playing, we had this after school basketball program for our high school guys, just as kind of informal, that a whole bunch of high school guys would come. We had a gym very similar to this. And uh, these gyms uh, have uh, basketball hoops that when they're folded down have very close behind them a concrete wall. And I was playing basketball with uh, these high school guys. I think this may be why I got out of youth ministry, actually. Uh, <laughs> And we were playing very intense, and somehow, I don't remember exactly how it happened, I mean, I ran hard into that concrete wall, like bad, and I threw out my back in the process, which I had never done before to that point. And I mean, I threw it out bad, like, I was still pretty young, but I injured myself to where I couldn't, like, for a few days, I couldn't really walk. And I, uh, I got put on some pretty high-powered pain meds and muscle relaxers and all of that stuff. And I learned really quickly, when you injure your back, the whole rest of your body is affected, right? You can't move your big toe and not have your back hurt <laughs> when your back is, is injured. <laughs> it's true. Uh, you can't blink your eyes <laughs> without your back hurting in some way. Like, our, our body is connected. And when, when one part of the body is hurt, it affects the rest. And I think Paul knows this. It's embedded in the way that he interacts with, with the church. He longs for them. He, he loves them and he wants to see them press on in the faith because he knows that their success in Christ, that their victory in Christ is not just a reflection on them, it's a reflection on the whole body. Amen? This must, I think, be our attitude in the body of Christ still today. Where we long to see the flourishing of our brothers and sisters Maybe even more than we care about our own flourishing. And I don't, I don't mean just within our own little church. I mean like even for the church down the street. When they win, we win. That's the way it works in the body of Christ. Because we're all part of the same body. Because we share one head and his name is Jesus. Now, I want you to jump with me to the, to the end of this uh, chapter because this is the part I want to spend the rest of our time on. You see this longing and this love coming through from Paul. And then at the end, you get this sort of benediction uh, part. This is actually a transitional kind of uh, chapter because in the first couple of chapters, you're getting all of this information about how these Thessalonians came to Christ, the way in which they received the gospel. He praises them you know, from turning from false idols to the living God. He outlines uh, kind of for them, remember what it was like when I was with you and, and how this all came to be. And then you see in chapter 3 kind of this transition where he kind of summarizes all that he has said. And you see that in these prayers, actually. And then in chapter 4, he's going to turn to sort of some more practical instruction. In light of all that God has done, in light of this gospel that you've received, here's some specific ways you still need to grow. Here's some specific ways you still need to live in light of that gospel. And just as a, a quick side note and a heads up about next week, in chapter 4, actually, he deals kind of head on uh, with some areas of sexual sin. And so that's why I scheduled Pastor Rob to preach next week. <laughs> because uh, I, I'm, that's, you know, I can figure some things out and I wanted him to handle that part. So, um, so but just as, a, just as a little note, he is going to talk about 
uh, that area because it's in the text, and he's going to talk about it very clearly next week. And so if you're a parent or a grandparent, you might even just consider that as you think about how you handle kids during service next weekend because it's, it's a big part of chapter 4. But at the end of chapter 3, as, we're, as he's making that transition towards talking about practical issues in your life, I want you to notice how his love for these people, his longing and his love for these Thessalonians, translates into three prayers. There's really three statements here. Uh, may, may our God and Father, may the Lord do these things. And he, he lists three things, and I think each one of them is important. The first one that he mentions in verse 11, he says, and maybe on the surface it sounds very simple to you, but I think it's very important. He says, now... May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. You've heard this uh, longing throughout the chapter that I read, right? He just, he wants to be with them. I mean, he's praying for them. He says he's praying for them every day. Every time he thinks of them, he's praying for them. And yet there's something inside of Paul that knows there is a difference towards knowing about someone from a distance and being with them face to face. I think especially in the 21st century, this is, a, this is a concept we've got to understand. You know, in some ways, I think it seems like there's a special bond here between Paul and the Thessalonians because of the, the persecution, the trials that they're facing. God has kind of brought them together, linked them together in this moment. But it's clear, it's very clear from what Paul says. It was never enough for Paul to just preach and then move on. He wants to be in bodily form. He wants to be physically with the ones that he loves. Why? Because I think this is the essence of the church. The church is not a task to complete, a service that you can come and check a box. The church is a family to belong to. And you, and you can't belong to a family very well when you're never physically in the same space. It's hard to learn to love each other when the only uh, glimpse you get is on a screen. It's hard to learn to love each other well when you don't have to see each other eye to eye and even to sort through differences eye to eye. It's part of how God designed us to work. And Paul knows it wasn't just enough to just preach and then move on and never see them again. No, these are his new brothers and sisters, and he wants to be with them physically. And I think we need, as a church, to be very serious about this as well. You can't be um, a connected member of this family and not show up physically in the midst of our family life. It just doesn't work. We need each other. We need each other. And we need to actually be in physical proximity for this family to work the way that God intends. Amen? Amen. The second thing uh, that he prays, he, he first prays that God would pr- make a clear way for them, you know, to be reunited. But then in verse 12, he says this. And again, each one of these kind of summarizing everything that he said so far in this letter. Verse 12, he says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. So the second thing he longs for in these people is that their love for each other would overflow. And then he says, notice how he says, for each other and for others also. It's both an inward and an outward love that it would overflow out of this gospel message that they've received. Why? Why is he saying this? Well, because, again, this is what's at the heart of a true Christian family, learning how to love each other and to share that love with others. This is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. I remember a a time when I was a kid, I... um, I don't know, I can't remember exactly how old I was. I, I'm thinking it was, I was maybe nine or 10 years old. And um, 
I've shared a little bit before, but my family life growing up was not always the most stable, and things were pretty rocky sometimes. And one of the ways they were rocky was financially. Uh, my dad lost his job a whole bunch of times over the years. And um, so that meant that there were a lot of times where we didn't have much money at all. And uh, bill collectors calling constantly, all of that kind of stuff. And I remember this one Christmas in particular. Again, I don't know. I, was, I think I was in elementary school. Um, probably is probably at least 30 years ago, I would guess. And um, my dad was out of the job. And someone from the church, I, I don't remember who it was, showed up at our door one December night as we were getting ready for Christmas with a whole bag full of food, ham, gift cards for our family, money. I think what, that my parents then used to get us Christmas presents. And um, here I am uh, 30 years later, and I'm getting choked up thinking about it. I don't remember who it was. I don't know if they said anything. I don't remember a lot of details. And yet when I was preparing this message this week, this memory flooded my mind. When I thought about love that overflows, this is what love in the family of Christ should look like. Showing up in tangible ways in the lives of brothers and sisters to remind them of God's love. To, to sort of to put flesh on God's love. Amen. This is why, um, this is why uh, we're doing the project that Chris Swinerman shared about a couple of weeks ago. Because God stirred his heart. His heart overflowed with love for uh, an elderly woman who's right here in our neighborhood, whose house is falling in, who needs a roof. And he said, you know what? Somehow we can do that together as a church. And so we've been ra you know, raising money. We've got a crew that's going to come in and help clean up the property. Not, not because we get anything out of it. She's not even a part of our congregation, but because this is what, this is what you do when you love Jesus. Your love that you've received from him, that he pours out on you, overflows then to other people. You know, I, I, like, I like how it says, you know, for each other and everyone else. And I, and I and notice what Paul says, because he, he says something that reminds me so much of Jesus. He, he basically says, just like I have loved you, you love one another, right? That's right there in the text. He in the same way that you've received love from me, and I came to you and invested in you in the midst of persecution, and you saw my love, now you share that with one another. That's at the heart of Jesus' message, isn't it? And we see it modeled in Paul. And by the grace of God, by the strength of his spirit, our hope is that we might see it modeled here as well. Finally, you, you get the last prayer. He says, you know, he he's prays uh, first, may the Lord allow us to have a path to come to you, fit to, to be with you. May the, the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. And then verse 13, may he strengthen your hearts so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Here he, he kind of talks, uh, he says blameless and holy. You know, what, is it, what does it mean to really be holy in God's sight? Holiness is the character of God, right? And the scriptures tell us that God is love. You know, what I, you know I think uh, our Methodist founder, how he would define holiness, is perfect love for God and for neighbor. It's learning how to receive the depths of his love and then to offer that love in its fullness to the people around us. So these, these requests that he has for them, they, they all go together. How are you going to remain blameless and holy? It's by allowing your love that you've received from him to overflow in praise of him and service to others, that you may think of yourself less and think of him and them more. Amen? You know, at one time I, I heard someone talk about holiness at a, a conference. I thought it was a beautiful analogy. They said 
Sometimes when we think of holiness, we think that holiness is something that um, it's like a it's like a mark that we carry somehow. Maybe it's something that we earn or that that we uh, that we achieve by avoiding certain things, and so it's something we feel like we need to protect. So we like try to keep ourselves away from whatever kind of messiness or dirty stuff, right? Because then I then I'll be holy. They said, but that's that's actually that's not the holiness that we see in Jesus. The holiness in Jesus is more like maybe something like bleach that's actually intended to go into the messy places. It's the thing that compels us to actually enter into the dirty places, not out of condemnation or out of judgment, but out of love and a desire for people to be set free. It's the thing that doesn't that causes us to avoid certain people. It causes us to run to certain people that we might take the light of Christ into dark places. That's the kind of holiness that Jesus distributed, displayed in his life. Actually, all of these things, these three things that Paul prays at the end, actually they're all just descriptions of Jesus when you think about it. Remember, what is the first one? He longs to be with them. Well, what did Jesus do? He, Paul said he longs to be with them physically, in proximity to them. Well, Jesus is the reality of our God who put on flesh and moved into our neighborhood. He, he satisfied that longing that Paul de- describes perfectly. He wanted to be near us, not just in theory, but in reality. The second one was he said that, is, that your love would overflow for each other and for, for everyone else. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. His, his love literally flowed out from his body in the blood that he shed upon the cross. Not because it was good for him, but it was good for everyone else. His, his love overflowed not just in nice words, but in sacrificial action. It would cost him everything. Paul says, I long for you to be blameless and holy until the day that he comes again. What was Jesus? He was blameless and holy, but not in a way that kept him separate from sinners, but in a way, rather, that brought the kingdom of God into dark places. See, these things that Paul is longing for the church, he's just longing for them to be more like our Savior. He's inviting us into the very life of Jesus. That as we experience the depths of his love, then we might be able to share that same life with other people. What if we longed for these same things? What if we prayed in this kind of way for each other? What if we celebrated the victories that we see in each other in Christ even more than we worry about ourselves? What if we did that like Paul? What if we had his heart? You know, when my, when my three boys, when my sons uh, experience some kind of victory in their life, when they have some kind of breakthrough or they do something really cool, I'm not, I'm not jealous of them. I'm not in competition with them. I'm joyful. Because in some way, I know, like, they're they're part of me. They're representing the family name. I I love what God is doing in them. Shouldn't it it be the same for all of us in this family? We're not in competition with one another. We're cheering each other on because we share the same family name. Pursuing holy love together together. Longing for the whole body to be healthy and flourishing and free. Because one, one limb of the body is in victory. The whole body is in victory. That was Paul's heart for the church. And I think it's actually Jesus' heart for our church as well. Let me pray for us. God, would you give us strength by your spirit? to be these uh, kind of people who care not just about ourselves, but long for the goodness and the wholeness that you desire to be characterized in every part of our body. And not just the body here at Stillwater, but 
in all the churches around this area and even around the globe, God. Would you give us a heart of longing and love for people just like Paul had for the Thessalonians, just like you had for us, Jesus? Would you implant that heart in us that your love that you first gave to us may overflow into all around us? And we pray this in your name. Amen.